Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, we made it again to Friday. I think each week feels a little bit longer than most these days. Um, so a lot's been happening as far as our restrictions being lifted and I think there's a bit of excitement there um, and maybe some trepidation, I don't know. Uh, and kids going back to school, which is something that I think it's been quite moving to see the kids walking down the street in their school uniforms and just thinking about what they've all been going through, I suppose, and how we're expecting still their studies to continue as normal. So um, if your kids went back to school this week, I hope they're okay. And um, mine goes back in a week and a half. So we'll see how that goes. So it's time for questions. Um, the first question we have is, uh, from Rob. Rob says he had a sleeve and a hernia repair for reflux. However, I'm still getting reflux. Am I doing something wrong as I don't want more surgery? Um, and reflux is quite a common thing that we see before surgery and after. Um, and it can be what we call mechanical. So if you've got a hernia or you've got um, what we call adipose, so fatty tissue or um, like a CTs and that sort of thing where you've got inflammation in the area or just a really solid um, wall of body fat that is actually behind your abdominal cavity. So it's actually within your organs and that's where the pressure comes from. So um, or it's not within your organs, it's surrounding those organs um, and your liver actually can house some fat. So overall, um, the body fat that forms like a big pregnant tummy, which happens in um, men particularly, that looks quite hard and um, feels like it's solid. That's often because the fat is actually deposited behind the abdominals um, and within the abdominal cavity itself rather than just under the skin. Um, and that happens more so with men just because of their... Um, composition, um, whereas women tend to hold our fat more what we call subcutaneously or under the skin. Um, so we'll feel soft and um, more um, candle-like, <laughs> um, whereas men will feel hard because their um, fat is also either intramuscular, which means it's within the fatty, in the muscular tissue, um, or intra-abdominal, which is also in the abdominal cavity, which is also where the risk increases for cardiovascular disease with that kind of abdominal um, obesity. Um, so that pressure, it could be mechanical that's causing the, her the um, reflux where you've just literally putting food into an area where there's just so much pressure squeezing around the tummy um, that if your digestion isn't moving fast enough and you then lie down a couple of hours later, you've got that reflux. Um, the other mechanical thing you can find is that the actual flap that covers the top of the stomach, it's like a lid that goes up and down like that, um, can become quite slack. So if you're putting food down that tube and you've got a nice tight lid on it, um, it contains your... Um, food within that stomach area. If your little um, flap there is loose, um, which can do with um, overfilling and um, fermentation and that sort of thing, just um, overall like inflammation and um, overuse of that or overstuffing it um, can help to make that a bit loose. Um, that's when um, undigested food has sat in the stomach and mixed with acid. And then if you put any pressure on, the lid flips open and the acid flicks up into your um, membranes, your tissues that are in the um, digestive tract, the start of the digestive tract. Um, that can be dangerous because while you're sleeping, you can get aspiration, which means it goes into the lung um, and causes infection and pneumonia. And that's how people get quite sick. Um, so the mechanical um, forms of reflux are that, you know, there's not a tight enough lid or there's too much pressure in that area or there's a hernia pressing up against that lid as well. Um, or it can be dietary. So when you've got either an excess of acid um, or you've just got a messy microbiome that's just not able to digest your food or you've got a lack of enzymes, um, 
that can also be a problem. Um, so that means that the, the particularly proteins and that sort of thing that need um, acid and enzymes to be broken down well, in the absence of those um, substances, there are um, digestions quite slow. So then food will sit in this chew it up, mix it with a bit of saliva and it goes into the stomach, but it doesn't necessarily get um, assimilated very well. So it will sit there for quite a while um, and that causes what we call fermentation. It's almost like, like it sounds like making a beer. So it's fizzy and it's burpy and gassy and it's um, uncomfortable. Um, and then it can have that um, when you're burping, it will, it will ferment and come back up into the um, upper part of the digestive tract. Um, so the other thing that can cause reflux is um, low stomach acid, believe it or not, because that means that food is also sitting there not being able to um, be broken down and taken through its digestive process quickly enough. Um, so some patients will feel that surgery will be the answer to their reflux and um, that's where the surgeon comes in looks at your history of your um, your health history and will determine which form of surgery is better for you. So some people who've had really, really bad reflux, um, they will go straight to bypass. Um, some who, um, yeah, I think, I think they see that more reflux patients will have a bypass rather than try the sleeve first. Um, so if you are still experiencing reflux after you've had your sleeve surgery, there's a few things to explore and it's um, maybe food sensitivity or just how healthy your digestion is. Um, we look at fibre, bringing lots of fibre into the diet will help with that um, acidic environment um, and just overall eating less processed foods, anything that's um, like refined flours and um, breads and that sort of stuff. We don't, um, our pastry, you know, general kind of not junk food, but foods that are um, something they've been through a process to become the food that they are today. Um, so keeping the diet pretty clean will help. Um, maybe adding in like a probiotic or talking to your practitioner about digestive enzymes to assist your digestive processes. Um, in some cases, when it looks like it is low stomach acid, we can stimulate stomach acid to release. Um, it's also about how quickly you eat. Um, so chewing your food really well, taking the time to actually um, send the messages to your brain and your digestion that food is coming in. So chewing is actually the very beginning of digestion. Um, and the minute you put food in your mouth and start to chew it, there's a whole lot of chemical reactions that take place um, in the digestive system, but also in your brain. So it's saying, okay, here comes food. I better get ready. Um, I better release digestive enzymes. I better help with some hydrochloric acid to help um, digest this food. Um, also different hormones are released that give you different um, understanding of um, so how full you are or um, how much you've eaten. So if you're eating really quickly, not chewing very well, you don't even get the chance to stimulate your digestion. So it's going in almost on an unprepared stomach and that's not ideal. Um, I've got a really great article on reflux and um, the debate on whether it is like a high acid environment or if it's actually a low acid environment. So um, the protocol after surgery can be that you've given a proton pump inhibitor like Nexium or Somac or something like that um, in the first period after surgery, and that's to help to keep the reflux at bay. Um, it's also a med medical a med a medicine <laughs> that um, it does need to be reviewed. So if you've been on a proton pump inhibitor for longer than about a six week period it would be time to ask whether that needs to continue. Um, they are really designed to be used for a short period of time. They're not a long-term use drug at all. Um, and they're linked with quite a few different um, side effects that definitely um, need to be avoided. Um, however, the reason we're so keen on preventing reflux and if it takes medication to do that is that um, the constant burning of your esophagus um, 
can change the cell structures in that area and that's where we get first um, Barrett's esophagus is a condition related to the constant reflux um, and esophageal cancer. So the reason that people who have really chronic reflux that can't find the, the cure for it are given these proton pump inhibitors, they weighing out the side effects of the drugs as opposed to the, the other risks of illness um, yeah, if the reflux continues damaging. So if you are experiencing reflux um, and you're really not sure how to manage that, it would be worthwhile checking back in with your practitioner, dietitian. Um, if you feel it's a mechanical, rule out a mechanical reasons. So maybe um, go visit your GP, tell them that you're having this regular reflux what you've done so far. Um, clean up your diet is a really big thing. Um, lots of, you know, clean liquid, you know, waters, that sort of thing. The other thing that's good to do is like a real um, solid gut health protocol. So something that's um, probiotic, um, prebiotic fibres to help new bacteria form. Things like the bone broth powders or um, things like um, glutamine and... Um, um, those nutrients that will help to support the health of your um, gut uh, membranes as well. So that was a pretty long answer. Um, <laughs> so I hope it answered your question. Um, but if you'd like the um, the flyer I have on reflux, please send me an email at Jackie, J-A-C-Q-U-I, at bnmulti.com, and I'll send it out to you. Thank you, Rob. Um, I hope I helped then. I'm rambling today. Um, the next question is Claudia. How often do I need my bloods checked and what are they looking for? Now, this is another long answer. Um, so before, you're, before you have your surgery, you're probably checked by your GP and dietitian and your surgeon for deficiencies. Um, in that period prior to surgery, if they pick up any deficiency, it's a really good time for you to smash in some nutrients and um, try and get to that um, healthy range before you go in. Um, and uh, most common deficiencies prior to surgery are similar to those after. You would think um, in, a way, in an obese patient, you would see that they are quite well nourished um, given that they like to eat some food. Um, however, we do see that there are vitamin D deficiencies. Um, it's quite often there's protein deficiency, um, B12, and also iron. So when, and vitamin D, I said that, didn't I? Um, so when you're looking at starting your journey, always ask for um, a really good nutritional panel of tests so that you know where you're at um, and then if you've got some time between your start of your process and your surgery ask what you need to do to make up the shortfall in those nutrients some people are given an iron infusion at the time they have their surgery just to boost iron levels and put some storage in the bank um, and that will be decide, decided by your um, dietitian or your surgeon at the time. So then after surgery, you should be having regular checks. I'm pretty sure, and it differs between different um, clinics, but three to six months is generally the rule of thumb. Um, three months initially, I would do three months for the first year and then maybe every six months forever. Don't um, always check your bloods and make sure that what you're doing is um making up your nutritional profile. So what they're looking for, and specifically after surgery, um, gastric sleeve and bypass generally have similar deficiencies. Um, bypass have a um, higher risk of the fat-soluble vitamins um, becoming deficient just because of the way that um, mechanical part of your digestion is um, rearranged a little bit. Um, so... Vitamin A, D, E and K can um, be a risk of deficiency after bypass surgery as well as the same nutrients with um, gastric sleeve. So the sleeve impacts on um, not only how much food you can fit in, both of the surgeries do, but also it, also, it impacts on the way that you can um, take on certain nutrients. So B12 relies on a certain um, protein that's a transporter for B12 and it's housed in the stomach. 
it's actually in the part of the stomach that they remove. So it's a little carrier protein called intrinsic factor. And um, when they remove the stomach, they also take that with it. So forevermore, the way you absorb B12 is actually, um, it's totally different and it's much less efficient. So um, you'll see in our BN multi formulation every day you're getting 500 micrograms of B12, which is um, something from the supermarket. A multivitamin you'd buy at the supermarket might have about three micrograms or it might have 35, but that's about really um, as high as you'll find it off the shelf. So you can see you've got... Um, many more times uh, the need for, um, and the research has shown that you need about 350 to 500 micrograms of B12 every day after surgery for life. So um, they're looking for B12 deficiency. Iron deficiency is huge in the community. And I think the research shows that about 48% of patients are iron deficient within the first or second year after surgery. So, um, the way that iron is absorbed, it relies on acid to be present. So um, the surgery actually release, uh, reduces the um, amount of acid that you have in your stomach. So the absorption is um, not as efficient. So you, do, you need more than the normal person would each day. Um, and it needs to be quite consistent. So it's something to check on as well. Vitamin D, um, also its job is to manage your immune system. Um, it's huge in cancer prevention. Um, it's a mood stabiliser. It helps with your um, to feeling happy. Um, so does iron. Um, and it also supports your cell um, growth. So it helps the cell to decide what it's going to be at the very, very beginning of cell formation. So they're looking for, um, in your bloods each time, they're looking for changes. So they'll compare your results. Um, this time to last time and just make sure that nothing's falling down or changing or it's propping up. Um, and that's how generally they will um, assess your overall health over the longer term. Always looking for protein sufficiency as well so and calcium. Um, so I hope that answered your question, but it's just another prompt to make sure that you're um, getting your bloods checked on a regular basis. Uh, I often hear people thinking that's just for the first year, that I only need to take multis for a first year and I only need to get my bloods done for the first year, but it, nothing changes after the first year. If anything, you could be drawing on your stores more of certain nutrients um, after that honeymoon period of the first year is over if you're not supplementing properly. Um, so if you need any more info on why the multivitamins are formulated the way they are, um, you're welcome to post that in the group um, and I'm always happy to talk about that. <laughs> um, so thank you, Claudia. Next question is Dawn, um, uh, the skin question. Is there anything we can do to reduce sagging skin as we lose weight, especially in the upper arms and inner thighs? Is there any kind of supplement, any specific stretches or exercises or is surgery the only option? Um, your skin um, elasticity or its capacity to return to um, meet the size that you are after you've had your weight loss. Um, it depends also, it tends, depends on a lot of things. Um, the first thing is your age, <laughs> also your um, health. So your nutritional health will be a big um, contributed to how quickly and how well your skin rebounds. Um, there's genetic factors involved in collagen formation. So the basis of your skin is um, we rely on collagen to, um, it's like a, um, it's like a net, like a, um, it almost like a, the mesh of the skin that would be holding it all together as a nice, strong structure. So like when you're getting older and you're starting to get wrinkles, that's because the collagen in the deeper layers of the skin starts to um, break down and it forms crevices and then the skin just falls in on top of that. So you'll see why people are doing like um, hyaluronic acid as fillers and that sort of thing. They're all parts of the um, makeup of the skin and the connective tissues. So, yes, um, 
there are things you can do. Um, but again, it's like if you blow up a balloon and you leave it blown up for two years um, and then you let that balloon down, that how would that look? It would be like a loose um, little stretched out bag, wouldn't it? Um, whereas if you blew up the same balloon to the same size and released the air just a few days later, you probably find there wouldn't be much change in the actual structure of that balloon. So it's very similar. It depends on how long that skin has been under duress and under stretch. Um, and then it also depends on how quickly, because the weight loss is so rapid after surgery, um, it can contribute to that as well. It's the same. It's just like being a big um, inflated balloon and then reducing the size of what's holding that um, structure out there as well. So it is up to you to manage your protein. Um, so the basis of collagen is vitamin C. So that's a real helper to making that um, connective tissue and keeping it nice and strong and healthy. Um, I'll also post in the group later that... Um, different nutrients that are good for like skin condition um, and skin integrity. Um, vitamin A is important and that can become deficient in patients after surgery as well. Um, I recommend protein, essential fats like fish oil, avocado, flaxseed oil, um, healthy omegas that are going in on a regular basis, keep your skin healthy um, and, and kind of well moisturised and um, elastic as well. So it does depend on a lot of things. Exercise-wise, um, the most important thing is to build underneath that skin um, some nice strong muscles. So um, that would take some space basically and leave less of that sagging effect. Um, it does depend on how big those parts of the body were as to and how big they are now. Um, but things like for legs, you could do some, I recommend um, what we call um, compound movements like lunges and squats and, you know, um, things that use your whole leg, your glutes, your lower back, that sort of thing, um, not just those, you know, back in the 80s when we used to lie on our side and lift our legs up. <laughs> work the um, adductors and the abductors and leave out the rest. I think it was really important that you um, really work the bigger muscles first before you worry about, you know, the tiny little things on the side that we don't use very often. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, but overall, it's good health and movement and doing the best you can. And, yes, for some people it is surgery that will help to give that, you know, final um, sculpted effect after the surgery. Some of the work um, I see is quite amazing. Um, and the last question, Teresa, oh, what's the best time to take the vitamins? Um, generally, we recommend morning and afternoon. The, the reason I say morning and afternoon is because some people are sensitive to the B group, quite high B in there, um, and that can wake you up. So you can take it at night if you don't find that it's stimulating you and you can get to sleep. Um, and um, the morning, of course, will get you going. So the best time to take them, we always recommend you take them after food. And the reason for that is, again, you're getting your digestive system ready and you're getting everything in place to actually take as much as you can from that supplement, um, as well as putting in, um, a supplement in with quite that, um, hit of iron some people can't tolerate that on an empty stomach it'll actually make you feel nauseous so if you're experiencing any nausea when you're taking the multis it can be that there's just not enough substance in the stomach to actually take that in um, and it's generally iron um, it'll make you feel almost like a dizzy um, nauseous kind of sweaty feeling for about half an hour afterwards um, and it tells you that, again, there's not enough in your tummy to do its job. So it's low, uh, low stomach acid um, and maybe that kind of microbiome. Um, they're proving now that um, probiotics also associated with helping to absorb iron and um, different forms of bacteria in the gut will also help that process along as well. Um, so you can take them morning and afternoon. If you're not stimulated, you can take them morning and evening. Um, if you're taking anything else, it depends also. So 
um, generally, I um, I suggest that if you're taking any other medication, you take it about two hours apart. Um, if you're taking an iron supplement or you're taking an extra calcium supplement, always take your multi and then take whatever else it is at least two hours after. Some um, different nutrients at certain levels will start to compete for absorption. Um, zinc is it's generally the minerals, zinc, iron, copper, um, and calcium. So when you're combining, like a lot of people are doing the hair, skin and nails thing and they're taking it with their multi and they're often they're knocking out their zinc. So they start to build up biotin and do other things, but then they'll turn up and get their bloods done and there's um, zinc has been knocked out, which is much more important than biotin, in my opinion. Um, so always ask if you've got other medication, if you've got, you know, thyroid medication or other like antidepressant medication and that sort of thing. Um, space them out. The research on um, antidepressants and particularly folate um, shows that um, when you're taking folate, which is in our product, um, and an antidepressant, it actually helps that antidepressant to function well. So it gives you a better benefit from the medicine. Um, and it also, um, folate, low folate is heavily linked to depression. So um, B12 folate, um, that sort of thing, are also linked to mental health anxiety. So is iron. So when your iron is low, your, anx your anxiety levels will often be through the roof. Um, I'm getting off track. Uh, so take them, yeah, morning and afternoon or morning and evening. If you're taking an extra calcium, normally I recommend you do that at night um, just before bed. It's away from everything else and it also will help you sleep. It's good for your heart and it um, will help you rest well. And do I have any more questions? No, I've got, I'll just check in the comments from where we've been. Hi, Erin uh, and Karen are here every week. It's so cool. Um, thanks for your time and the information. I found the reflux interesting. I've never had reflux until now, nearly two years post-surgery. Uh, that's interesting. It's funny how things go along and then suddenly something will change and it's having a look at um, what happens. Also, as we age, our digestive secretions are impacted. So generally after 50, you'll find that um, there's less um, enzymatic activity, so less of the stomach and um, pancreatic enzymes and that sort of stuff being released with a meal. So you'll see in the elderly very similar deficiencies to weight loss surgery patients because of the low stomach acid. Um, they'll start to fall low in B12, iron, calcium, and they're the ones that rely on the acid. So as you age, as a weight loss surgery patient, you may need to monitor things closely as well. Thank you. Um, so we've made it to 1.30. Um, we're back next week. I'm wondering if the 1 o'clock is going to work now that everybody's heading back maybe out of the house and back to work. So we're doing a poll during the week um, just to see if the one o'clock on a Friday is a good time for everybody. Um, I've also um, set up a little, there's a chat um, call in the group and I'm going to play around with that to see if we can do like a two or three way, maybe a workshop or something like that. So stay tuned for that. There's always something happening here. And um, it'd be nice to have a two-sided exchange. It's quite, um, it'd be nice actually, especially these days. Two-sided is always good. Um, and we do have some winners of the um, competition this week. And um, oh, it was on the liver. So the winners of um, my favourite person, Sandra Cabot, Dr Sandra Cabot, um, has been a bit of a hero of mine for a whole lot of years. She wrote the liver cleansing diet and she also is um, just an incredible um, doctor as well as a very holistic approach to her work, which I always appreciate. And I'm meant to do some podcasts with her and I must follow that up. So the winners of Sandra Cabot's book but for answering all the questions about liver health was, ah, was um, Stephanie Krupika and um, Karen Reed Rutherford. <laughs> So I'm glad Karen's here and so congratulations and um, I'm sure you'll enjoy her book and if you can give us some feedback in the group on what you found in the book, we'd love that.
Um, and we'll be doing, we've got another couple of books of Sandra's to give away in the next couple of weeks. So we'll do another competition again. So thank you for all who entered. Um, and um, I'm sure you'll win one of the kooky comps we run uh, in the group. So stick around and thanks again for your input and have a good week and go 150 kilometres this weekend. See you later. <laughs>